Well, today's lesson, and today's lesson we'll be talking about the continuum concept, uh, the continuum approach in solving problems, or, or the continuum assumption. Now, what's the continuum assumption? Well, to explain it in a practical way, assume we have two jars. All right, and then we have another one right here. Say they have identical geometry. This one has a molecule that moves this way, and then this one has a molecule that moves this way. And then say this jar right here has air in it, meaning that there's billions of molecules inside. Now what the continuum assumption says uh, is that we can assume uh, this jar to the right here is the same jar as one that's smoothed out, meaning we can assume that there's molecules in every inch of, uh, or every region of space, and then we could also, another word for it is, uh, we can assume that this is a smoothed out, smoothed out jar meaning that we neglect all molecular effects in this uh, situation as we're studying it. Um, this is really useful for uh, approximating or averaging out your uh, real situation and you would end up with an identical situation to real life because of the amount of molecules inside the jar. So the continuum assumption in, in short allows us to or, or uh, allows us to consider the situation as a smoothed out situation and we neglect all effects of molecules of air because there's so many of them. While this situation to the left here, we cannot neglect molecular behavior because there's only two molecules, so we have to study it in a different way. In the situation on the left here, this is usually called statistical thermodynamics. also known as the microscopic approach of thermodynamics. Well, this situation to the right here, this is the engineering thermodynamics study, where we're not concerning uh, ourselves with the uh, We're not concerning ourselves with the uh, individual behavior of the molecules, and we can neglect all behavior. So let's say we're studying this region of space here, and then we're studying an identical region of space right here. If we draw the pressure versus time curve for this region, and then we do the same thing here, what do you think we're going to have for our activities? Well, because there's so many molecules here, you're probably going to have something close to... Actually, let me draw another one here. Sorry if this is messy. You're going to have a pressure versus time curve here. So the activity here for the pressure versus time curve, you're going to get something like this. So basically, you're going to get uh, this sort of behavior if you're analyzing this region of space right here. What are you going to get here? Well, you might go on for a very long time without any noticeable pressure in this region, so you can go forever and ever without any of the molecules ever reaching that space and inducing pressure. Or you could get like one curve like that and then you'd go on for a while without any, any more pressure induced in that region. So as you can see, we, this will result in a problem. We can't really study that system without considering the individual behavior of the molecules, how likely they are to hit that spot, which is why it's called statistical thermodynamics. So you'd study each molecule on its own. And then for this, for this situation here, you're going to get this sort of zigzag pressure because there's that many molecules, and you'd get about the same occurrence overall. And what the continuum ap approach allows us to do is we can take this situation as sort of like have it as a straight line. And this would still be a valid, valid for engineering problem solving. 
because there's so many molecules again. So uh, when can we know or how do we know if our problem is continuum valid? When do we know that assumption holds true for our problem? Well, if you have a container and has air, you can intuitively know that there's so many molecules of that air that you'll never have uh, this situation to the left here. You don't have to consider each molecule on its own. There's also another quantity known as the Knudsen number, which I'll get into in a bit. So usually when we're talking about the continuum approach, we're discussing that for gases only. Uh, if you think about it, in the case of liquids and solids, you're always going to you're never going to have this situation to the left. You're always going to have that many molecules to create the phase of a solid or of a liquid. So this is usually brought up only in the situation of gases. Now what what is the nuts and number I mentioned earlier? This is another way to quantify or check our assumptions validity. The nuts and number known as nuts and number known as Kn is equal to lambda over Lc where lambda is the mean free path. and your LC is the characteristic length. So what does the mean free path mean? Well, the mean free path, say you have four molecules. It's the average distance between success, successive collisions, the average distance the molecule will travel to before it collides to with another molecule. So in this situation here to the right, your mean free path is going to be on the scale of nanometers, if not if not smaller. So the nuts and number ends up being in units of length over length. So you're going to have, usually in this situation to the right, you're going to have your, and even the situation to the left, you're going to have uh, very small numbers, but for the situation on the right, you're usually going to have on a scale of nanometer, which means this number is usually very small for a continuum uh, valid problem. This number is usually smaller than 0 0.01. If it's not smaller than this quantity right here, then your problem cannot be assumed to be continuum and you'd have to use statistical thermodynamics. But most of the time, if this, if this is true, or all of the time when this is true, then your problem is continuum valid. So how do we calculate the, usually the mean free path will be given to you, at least in this course, or in other thermodynamics courses, uh, to my knowledge, to the extent of my knowledge. But the uh, characteristic length will usually, I recall, studying that in heat transfer and it's usually there's no unique definition I've seen it being defined as the square root of the surface area of the container I've seen it being used as the uh, cube root of the volume of the container so the characteristic length is that defining length of your container so that's usually in our in our case is going to be on the scale of centimeters versus nanometers and you can see how you would have a very small number in the usual case thus satisfying this this situation or this condition here. But a common definition for the LC is usually the characteristic length is usually equal to the volume over the surface area. So for a sphere, a sphere's characteristic length is usually R over 3. And a cylinder is usually R over 2. LC and then LC here. So we can check this through calculating, let's use the sphere example. I'm going to have 4 over 3 pi r cubed all over 4 pi r squared. r squared goes with the r squared here, you're going to get left with an r, pi goes with the pi, and then 4 goes with the 4. So you're left with 1 over 3 r 
which is the characteristic length of a sphere. So when you have a spherical container, that's usually going to be your LC, and then you can plug these values here, calculate the nuts and number, and figure out if your problem is can be assumed to be continuum, and thus you'd, the way to solve it would be a lot simpler, I imagine, compared to using statistical thermodynamics. So that covers the continuum concept for today. Thank you for listening.